This is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory Glory to to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering a gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on your way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows that you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Everyone, or maybe most of us, know someone in the family, or maybe it's a friend, who loves wrapping presents. Who loves wrapping presents in the right way. In the right way for the occasion, in the fanciest ribbons, in the bag that can be reused again. In some artful way, some people just love to wrap presents, that is. And in my family, it's me because I feel like I feel like it's a way for me to get my creative energy out, that it's a a way that I can do something artful. My fascination with this, with wrapping presents, with making them pretty on the outside, started when I was little. And I remember one time in particular, I wrapped a present for my sister, and I was, well, I don't know, maybe 10 years old or so, And I honestly don't remember what the present was, but I remember what the wrapping looked like because I spent a lot of time on it. I handmade it out of paper, a paper bag and some markers and maybe even some stickers and some words. And I thought, that's just perfect. It was just how I wanted it to look. And it was, and I set it right beside all of her other presents that were in that factory-made wrapping paper. And I thought, that looks great. I can't wait for Julie to open it. But as you might be able to see where I am going, 
She didn't even notice the wrapping. She just tore right through all of her presents, including the one that I had taken so much care in putting together. Presents are filled with, with happy things, gifts, gift bags and ribbons and clips and curly cues and markers and shiny things. They all make me happy. And art can make us all happy. We all have our form of art. Wrapping makes gift, just makes gifts extra fun. Now, this is the part where I might want to say, hey, Jesus, that present looks really pretty, and I want to open it. That gospel there is really approachable. But today, it's the opposite. I feel that Jesus' difficult words are hard to approach and kind of the opposite of a present that I would like to open. Remember, we are listening to Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount, and I need to remind myself that it's full of impossible instructions, some perfect kingdom sorts of things that when put on the grand scale, just seem unfathomable, for humans at least. We may be able to, here in this place, be able to step back and look with kind of a grain of salt to, to know the truths that Jesus is getting to, to know the story of the Old Testament, to know the Ten Commandments, and to know that God has told us these things. God has told us, you shall not murder for a reason, and we agree with, with something like that. We agree with that commandment, and we can check it off our list. But the specifics of Jesus' teaching can get a little much. Jesus is telling the gathered Jewish people at the time, probably some Gentiles listening too, but it says the disciples are listening the gathered Jews who are occupied by the Romans, who have this mix of culture, who are living and trying to live into community. And they know the commandments. They have the commandments to guide them. And they have made human rules. They have taken the commandments and adjusted them to their society, the way that they live together. So, Today, Jesus is saying, it's important that you follow the commandments of, our, of God, and it's important how you live them. And those can be two different things, as we know. So the explanation of the rules makes it difficult to hear. Jesus' words are not the memorized sorts of kitschy phrases that we like to post on our walls, or look to for, for uh, inspiration. But they are applied and specific. And Jesus, what you say is uncomfortable, Jesus, is what I'm saying to myself, to Jesus. This is uncomfortable, Jesus. It's offensive, even. What do you mean by you don't want me to be angry? That's a natural consequence of people. Uh, making me angry. Uh, what do you mean you don't want me to say false swears? I'm just, uh, you know, swearing on that mountain over there or, or trying to tell you that I'm, that I'm for real when I tell you these oaths and vows. This is what people might be saying. And, well, Jesus, you really, really make me want to turn away and walk away when you mention divorce. So right now, I need to, we need to separate ourselves, I think, or at least I do, I did, separate myself from the divorce, the word that was used in the first century and what Jesus is speaking to in some regard, to, from our divorce and our concept of it today. And this is where we can get offensive if we don't do that separation. We can get offended, I mean, if we don't do that separating. 
Jesus talks about it, though, and so we need to. We need to stop and check ourselves. So I want to hopefully open us all up for a new understanding and maybe to learn something from this teaching from Jesus. Jesus is teaching his first hearers, who are Jewish men. Men in that time had all the rights, and especially in, the, uh, in marriage. Women and men were separated except for in the household, and most of them were married. They had distinctive roles, and women were honestly seen, as we know from our history, honestly seen as more property than a relationship. So if a man high in society wanted a divorce for any reason, he could just sign a paper, and he could do that. All he had to do was submit a request, and that left the women at the mercy of the men, the compassion or lack thereof of the men around them, of their husbands. So if a woman was taken out of a marriage, we think, oh, well, you know, she can get an apartment down the street and get a job and everything. But no, we're in the first century. This was something where they were thrown to the streets, literally. Her social status, her The money was all gone, no housing, no food. And she would have to do anything just for survival, just to earn a crumb of bread. I'm telling you all of this not for a history lesson, but because this gets to a little bit of what Jesus is talking about. Remember Jesus at the beginning of the the Sermon on the Mount said, Blessed are those who. These things are good to know because these things that Jesus says that offend us today are good news. They're good news for somebodies out there who are the victim of the structure of society They're good news for the people who are hated, the ones who are the victims of lust, unfaithfulness, and the ones who are without relationship, who are unforgiven and unreconciled to the community. So back to our own understanding. We are offended with the word divorced, but we don't need to be. I invite you to read the gospel again with these things that, that uh, we've talked about so far. And know that Jesus loves all people. Jesus was speaking for the unloved to let them be loved. Jesus was speaking for the outcast, the burden, the victims. He's not standing there with a pen and paper as we might sometimes assume or, I don't know, want him to, checking off everyone who's done this or is this or is not this. Sometimes I think we think the commandments are for that, and in some way they are when they point us back to Jesus, when they point us back to life giving things. So Jesus is standing there holding the mirror up to the people that is meant for healing. And it's meant for changing behavior, behaviors that may have gone awry. Because the mirror of the law through the commandments, like I said, is life-giving. And it's by this mirror that we also know our sin. We know our inward reflexes toward selfish gain, easy things, comfortable things, extra things. We struggle with the law And why? I tell myself it's because I struggle with sin. But God knows this. God knows we struggle. God knows we struggle with law and sin and our understanding of of human behavior. God knows. Because it's the same law and grace that God speaks God's good word through Jesus and Moses 
and God's people. They know the people who are standing there in the first century know the Ten Commandments and the story surrounding it. The story surrounding it, how God gave them Moses. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments to give to the people for guidance. And it was for guidance for living with God. So Jesus is not saying anyone is on the outside of the realm of God's love and forgiveness. He's saying, hey, y'all need to check your social structure and the motives behind them. So look back to the story of Exodus, of Moses in the wilderness and the exiled people. It's before the commandments are given. Before the commandments are given, and the first listeners know these words, and we need to remind ourselves too. Because the words before the Ten Commandments are the wrapping that they come in. And the wrapping is God. The wrapping is God's identity. God tells the people, I am your God. I am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the life of slavery. It's how God wrapped the gift of life. So we don't need to turn away from today from what Jesus says. We need to turn back to God and to see the life that is given through these words, through this person, through this God. So the rules are dot, 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 fill in the blank. But what Jesus says, this means, this means you are to be the active peacemaker. You are the one who is called to resist temptation. And you are the ones who protect the lives of your brothers and sisters. Commandments are not named. They're not named to be a scored piece of paper with checks and marks and crosses out. They're not tickets into the good graces of a wrathful God that we might picture. Commandments are the gifts to the community because the community is God lived out. The commandments from God are the gifts that give life to the community. And just as sin, no sin is individual. No sin is experienced on our own. Ever secret though they are, even if you try, they are felt by the community. And it's like this with the commandments as well. It's like this with our God. And that's what Jesus is saying. We are together in this. We are a communal people, and you are God's love experienced in the world. So the good news today is that we have Jesus. We have Jesus who holds the mirror, who holds his arms out for us, who loves us so much that he says, you look at the commandments, check your motivation, know that I love each and every one of you. Consider your part in the story of being peacemakers in God's kingdom, Jesus says, and life givers and truth tellers. Because that is a reflection of who God is. And that's who we are. And we are to offer forgiveness in relationship. And through this healing and wholeness, we are part of the wrapping that is God's kingdom love. 
Amen.